what we left off was our potential targets, failure to intercede. That's the reason I'm starting with failure to intercede, even though it sounds like it may be something like this, sort of a trailing issue. And I guess in reality it is, is because it's a good way to capture all your ancillary players. And what we do at my office when we're putting together one of these um, cases is the first thing that we'll do, and we try to do this before we even file the case, is to get the entire body of juvenile court records together so we can go through them and look at what's there and really tease out what our vision, because all of this starts with your vision of the case, what it is that you think you're going to put in front of the jury to motivate them to do what you want them to do, which is to give your client a boatload of money, right? I mean, that's what this civil litigation is all about, it's about money. So you have to have the tools to put together your vision about the case, and that starts with the records. The records and your client, those are your two best resources. Um, so then what we do is we'll make a list of names, and you put, every time a name comes up in any of those documents, you write down their name, you figure out what their role was in the case, and what function they performed, who they were working for, were they government, were they a private hospital, who they worked for, and then of course the, the employer's name and identity. And you're going to develop this long list of characters in what you're putting together like a screenplay. Because ultimately, a jury trial has a lot in common with a movie or a screenplay, right? In a movie or a screenplay, you're watching, and all these scenes are unfolding, people, characters are coming in and developing and doing what they do to develop a story. And usually in that context, it, it flows more or less chronologically, right? When you go to a play or a movie, it you know, starts at the beginning and then goes through them. Sometimes you get flashbacks, but I, I hate those. But, uh, <laughs> at least in the movie. And, but you know, it flows more or less chronologically one scene to the next. The jury trial is a little bit, actually it's quite a bit different because you're still looking at the same function, which is to tell a story, but you don't necessarily have a lot of control how those characters come in, when they come in, how they present. So what we want to do is first figure out who all those characters are going to be. And that's when you start developing your vision of what the story is that you're going to present to the jury. And the characters that don't fit in that story, we typically won't suit. But we do cast a very broad net. We'll, we'll name a lot of people that ultimately, through discovery, we figure out don't belong there. Then you dismiss them. You're allowed to do that. And you dismiss them as you figure out, oh, this guy doesn't belong here, that guy doesn't belong here, he didn't do anything, he was actually helpful, we don't want to sue him because he's going to help us out, right? Um, so that's how we start with the structure of the complaint. That gets us the ability to intercede. Any time that you have these government agents working together, there's almost always going to be somebody that's just kind of standing there. You know, like a supervisor, maybe a cop, maybe the beat cop that came out to keep the peace. And they're always uh, potential targets because they have a duty when they see a constitutional violation going down, they have a duty to you or to your, your plaintiff to step in and stop it. Okay, you see a lot of this in the police litigation. Um, the same principles apply to social workers. So if a supervisor sees her subordinate out in the field or his subordinate out in the field, and they, and they conference, right? They're required in their policy, their training. The social worker in the field, they'll tell you this in depth. Oh, I don't have the authority to make that decision on my own. I have to call my supervisor, we conference, maybe talk to a director, and we make this decision in the collective. So okay, that's fine. That doesn't get him off the hook. He's still there. He's the guy out and actually grabbing the kid. So you don't lose him as a defendant. But what you do do there is you loop in the supervisor. And you have full uniform. Full uniform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, uh, you, you're the one that knocked on the door. Yeah, yeah. So, well, did you have your, your, your gun? So, well, yeah. And your taser? Well, yeah. And what about that stick? What do you call that? The, the baton. Did you have that? <laughs> So, well, no, I left the baton in the car, along with your shotgun. Yeah, I left that in the car. I said, who was with you? Oh, the Officer Jones, his partner or whatever. So, was he in his uniform? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his, his gun? Yeah. Taser? Yeah. Okay, and, and he was like, where was he standing when you, when you banged on that door? Remember, see how we did that? Went knocked on the door to banged on the door, right? 
So, oh, well, he was standing like right here. So, so completely obscuring the view of the street. Between the two of you, you, you blocked the view. You, you know, filled the doorway. Oh, so, yeah, probably. Yeah. And when mom came to the door, uh, what'd you tell her? Well, I told her that uh, social services was here and needed to see her kids. Did she invite you in? Yeah, she invited us in. Tell me how that went. Well, I don't remember exactly. Well, your client's going to tell you how it went. And then you ask him, well, where, where were you when the social worker was interviewing the mom? Let's start there. So I was, uh, you know, out of the way, standing in the corner. So like that? Your arms crossed like that? Yeah. Your gun right here? Yeah. And then your taser, too, on the ready. Yeah. Where's your partner? He's on the other side of the room, pretty much the same way. Well, what that starts to look like, to me, is coercive force, right? They're the muscle. And that's the, that's the argument you're going to make to the jury is, yeah, okay, fine. They're there to keep the peace. Against who? They didn't keep the peace when the social worker grabbed the kid and walked out the door. They could have stopped her. They, they were there, well, and, and you ask him this question, well, when you were there, did you look around the house? Yeah. Nice place? Yeah, it was a pretty nice place. Clean, right? Yeah, really clean. Did you get a chance to go in the kitchen? So, well, I, I watched the social worker. You know, we keep the peace, so we follow her around, keep her safe. So, did she go in the kitchen? Well, yeah, she did. Did she look through the cupboards? Yeah. The fridge? Yeah. Was there food there? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of food. Nice place, kitchen clean, no, no garbage out, anything like that. Oh, no, it's great. It's okay, great. So it looked like a safe environment. Yeah, well, I, I don't know I'd call it safe, but, you know, it was a nice place. Oh, okay. Well, now, now you're starting through the cop. You're starting to develop some of the issues that you have to address in your exigency analysis, right? Was the child in a safe environment? The cop, gun, badge, all this, uh, these badges of authority and state credibility that, that everybody loves their cops. These are the heroes of 9-11, right? This cop is saying it's a safe place. There was food there, it was clean. They stood there with their gun and their badge and their, their taser, you know, to keep mom intimidated. But other than that, it was a nice place. That act, so you use them for two purposes. One is to establish the environment, because your social worker's gonna lie. They're gonna talk about flies and spider webs and, you know, bloody steak on the counter and dirty dishes, all kinds of crap that just, you know, isn't real. You can trust the cop. They typically will get that stuff right. Um, but where you hook them is on being the force, the government force, the coercive force that is there in place to keep mom in line and the parents in line to support the social worker while she conducts this unlawful seizure or search or whatever the case may be. And that's where you get them on failure to intercede because the cops, even though they don't get the training, they should get the training, but they don't. They do get Fourth Amendment training, so they know the general rules, and you'll get this from them in their depositions. They know the general rules that apply to search and seizure. Uh, what they don't know is the specifics of the rules that apply to the relationships between parents and children. So they have an argument, qualified immunity argument, that when they are there to keep the peace, that they didn't know that there was a violation going on and so there was nothing to intercede in. Uh, I've only done one of these cases that made it all the way through trial, and we did, the, the county settled, they were really smart. They uh, settled the case before trial. The city refused to pay anything, not even a dollar. And so the judge let us go on our failure to intercede theory. The county argued, and they'll argue this every single time, the county argued that the cops there just to keep the peace, he's an ancillary component of the entire event, and therefore there's no liability. The issue is, was he an integral participant? And as the muscle, the guy with the gun and the badge and the taser and all that and the uniform to intimidate the parent as the muscle in that event, he was an integral participant. It probably wouldn't even have gone down the way it did if the cop wasn't there with his gun and his badge and all that other stuff. So you have your integral participant um, theory, and I think generally you're always going to be able to get over that. Um, you know, just by the cop being there in full accoutrements, intimidating your plaintiff. So anyway, yeah, your targets are going to be the social workers, supervisors, anybody who participated in the decision to detain. That's another thing that we see with cops. I don't know how they do it out here, but out in California, oftentimes the social workers, they have this form, they call it the blue form. 
And what they'll do is they'll get the cop on site, who they called out to keep the peace, to sign the blue form. Well, what the blue form is is a request to detain. And the cops, they don't read these things. They just sign them. And when you read it, it's the cop requesting that the social worker detain the child. So now they're no longer an integral participant, right? That's evidence that they're the decision maker. So you sue them for that, straight up, just as if they were the taking social worker. Now you've got a cop who signed off on a form requesting that the social worker take, a social worker who's trained on the rules and the circumstances that are appropriate to take, and the social workers have an independent duty, affirmative obligation, when a cop asks them to do this, to do their own assessment. They can't rely, on, legally, they cannot rely on the assessment of the cop. So they have to do their own assessment. So they, they went ahead and complied with the request, took the kid, so they're also on the hook as a direct participant, the seizing social worker. And uh, that's how we end up looping them all in. Yeah, Joe? Is there precedent, um, U.S. or federal district, that, that recommending or requesting the removal puts liability on that person that recommended or requested No, it's, it's the decision to detain. So necessarily, and this is the argument, and I haven't lost on this argument, so I mean, I assume it's a valid argument, is that the request itself, the cop making the request, has already decided he wants to detain the kid. And he has the authority. Hey, he can actually detain on his own. If the, and this happens sometimes. If the social worker disagree, dis disagrees, the cop says, ah, screw it. I'm going to take the kid anyway. I just had one of these cases um, in Orange County. We settled it for $1.5 million. Uh, sheriff didn't even investigate. She's in the car on the way down to the hospital talking to the social worker. Social worker says, hey, look, under, and this social worker has been sued herself like four times for wrongful seizures. The social worker tells the cop, hey, we're not gonna seize this kid. You know, under our policies, our training, we gotta get a warrant, we're not gonna do it, he's in the hospital, he's safe, he's fine. Cop says, uh, okay, that's fine. Calls the deputy that's on the scene, says, go seize that kid. <laughs> so there you go, I mean, you get him anyway. And we ended up suing both the social worker and the cop because, and this gets into what I was just talking about, the social worker's independent duty to do her own assessment. The deputy sees the kid at the directive of his detective, uh, transferred custody of the kid to the social worker, and she has an independent duty, right, to assess whether or not there's an exigency at that moment in time. She doesn't do it. She doesn't do the assessment. Is she that a statutory duty? Uh, yeah, that's a statutory duty in California. I, I would assume pretty much every state, you gotta remember that um, the statutory construct across all states, there's minor differences, but they're pretty much uniform because they're driven by the overarching federal statutory scheme that requires certain safeguards be put in place. And one of those safeguards is that the social worker's you know, doing their independent job. So I, I would suspect that if you, if you dig, you're gonna find something in your own jurisdiction that is similar to what we have out there. And so anyway, what happens is we, we sue both the social worker and the cop for unwarranted seizure. And then uh, we'll get into some of the other things that happen in the case later on when we get to medical exams and vaccinations and stuff like that. There's a whole slew of violations that came out of that. Yeah, more potential targets. It's not necessary to show that a defendant directly or personally participated in the constitutional violation. Rather, a defendant is also liable for setting, this is, this is cool, for setting in motion a series of acts by others which the defendant knows or reasonably should know would cause others to inflict a constitutional injury. Now somebody, I think it might have been you, was talking earlier about social workers calling in their own mandated report mm -hmm. that's false, presumably, and you know, then the agency logs the referral, and they go out and investigate this new thing and end up taking the kid or doing some other bad thing. So the social worker that made that call, that man mandated reporter, and this goes directly to why you need her information. You need to know who she is. She's a defendant because we know that uh, a defendant is also liable for setting in motion a series of acts by others. And that call, that false call, what did it do? It set in motion a series of acts by others that effectuated the constitutional violation. So you can see that, that you have a lot of options here when you're looking for potential targets. 
and the key to it is the underlying records. You really need as complete as possible, unredacted records of everybody that had a fingerprint anywhere on your underlying juvenile dependency case. Supervisors, we talked about this a little bit. This is a this cool Star V. Baca. This is a Ninth Circuit. I think that was a, came out of Arizona. Uh, supervisor's action or inaction in the training, supervision, or control of his or her subordinates may be sufficient to show a constitutional violation. So that's where maybe, and I'm not sure if Greg McKay is the one responsible for promulgating policy, training, uh, disciplinary action, anything like that, but whoever is responsible for you know, that level of supervision, if they know there's an issue going on, they've been put on notice there's an issue going on, they fail to go in, investigate, and otherwise control the workers that are effectuating the violations, they themselves also may be liable, they're another potential target. So you, you just go up the chain of decision makers. Who made the decision? Who did they have to talk to to get authority to make the decision? Who did that person communicate with, whether they had to or not? Did whoever they communicate with agree? You just go up the chain until you find you know, a no answer, and then that's probably where your uh, list of defendants is going to end. Okay. Finally, we get to the meat. So we, we got the whole kind of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, body of law that you're going to apply in assessing and prosecuting one of these claims, whether it's a search and seizure claim or medical care claim or a judicial deception claim. Now we're going to sort of get into the specific um, issues of each different type of claim. <coughs> All right. First question you always, always, always have to ask and resolve correctly is whether this is a procedural or substantive right that you're going to be litigating. The reason it's important to know that from the outset is number one, it's going to affect your vision of your story that you're going to construct for the jury and for the judge because the, the analysis for substantive claims and procedural claims is different. And if you, get the, if you get the wrong moniker attached and the judge starts applying the wrong analysis, you'll lose for all the wrong reasons, but when you get up on appeal, they're going to look at it and they're just going to tell you, hey, you screwed this up. There's nothing we can really do to help you. So it's important that you get the analysis correct at the outset. And it's really cool because the Ninth Circuit, again, going to their model instructions and the use notes, they have a lot of really good law and information there. And they, they lay this out for you probably actually much better than I ever could in a single slide presentation. They have pages and pages and tons of analysis. But anyway, the basic nut of it is a claim for interference with the parent-child relationship may be brought either as a procedural due process claim or a substantive due process claim. Think unwarranted seizure. That's procedural, right? There's a procedure to get this kid without a, a warrant versus judicial deception, which is a substantive. You have a substantive right not to be lied about in uh, the prosecution of criminal or juvenile dependency actions. <coughs> the substantive versus procedural determination makes a huge difference in which test will apply and how the court and a jury is going to view your case. Procedural due process for these claims, well, these claims typically arise when a state official removes a child from her parents' care, that probably seems obvious, right? Um, think unwarranted seizure. For those types of claims, the 14th Amendment guarantees the parents' rights that they will not be separated from their children without due process of law except in emergencies. For the kid, remember, it's the 4th Amendment that's going to apply. The child also has a 14th Amendment, you know, the same 14th Amendment right, but what the courts have done, they, they've said this, I think in Wallace, actually, um, that look, it's all the same analysis, whether it's 4th or 14th Amendment, doesn't matter. So for the parents, the kids, everybody, we're going to apply that procedural due process analysis on the unwarranted seizure claim. So what that means to us is that there is no scienter element, that is, there's no state of mind required. The violation is complete where the removal is done without either a court order or a reasonable cause to believe the child's in imminent danger of serious bodily injury. That's exigent circumstances. Generally, the inquiry will be equivalent to an examination of the child's Fourth Amendment rights. And if you look uh, right now, the most current cases, those are all out of uh, 
Well, two of them are out of Arizona, one's out of Nevada. It used to be that all the cases were coming out of California because that's the only place that people were litigating these things. Now we've got uh, you guys out here jump on, jumping on, getting on board, and uh, doing your part to you know, push the law more and more in our favor. So Damari, that's an Arizona case. Keats, it's an Arizona case. That's Deanne's case. And um, you know, it's good stuff, good work. Substantive due process, these claims typically involve egregious conduct. Remember, for the unwarranted seizure, we're just looking at the procedure. Did they follow it or not? If they didn't, they lose. When we're looking at judicial deception, we get a little, it's a little bit more of a, a nuanced analysis. We have to look at, number one, the egregiousness of the conduct. I think everybody will agree, and the Ninth Circuit certainly agrees, that lying in a judicial proceeding is egregious conduct. So that, that, that used to be a big argument before um, Hardwick came out. You know, they were always arguing about that. Now it's, it's been resoundingly resolved in the plaintiff's favor. I think the language from the Ninth Circuit was no uh, worker with an IQ greater than the room temperature in Alaska would think that it's okay to lie in court proceedings. So it's, it's just finished. That's the, I don't expect to see that argument again. Um, you never know, though. I mean, I you never underestimate the competency of, um, you know, the government attorneys. Which, which case was that? It's Hardwick versus County of Orange. Thank you. Yeah. And it's, I think that was a 2018. Might have been 17. I don't remember. Uh, again, going back to the substantive due process, that's the judicial deception claims. They typically involve egregious conduct like lying in court reports, but official conduct only violates substantive substantive due process when it shocks the conscience. That's the standard. Um, under the overarching test of whether the official's conduct shocks the conscience, there's two conscience, there's two standards. There's the intent to harm standard, which does not apply in these cases. We, we don't care whether they had an intent to harm or not. What we always go for is the deliberate indifference standard because every social worker knows or should know that you can't lie to the court to get your job done. All right. So when you do that, you're acting um, with deliber deliberate indifference to the known rights of the parents and the children. And then under the deliberate indifference standard, when it, this is actually kind of cool because we're going to get to it a little bit later about extended opportunities. The social workers have a duty to correct things that they know are wrong. So when extended <laughs> opportunities to do better are teamed with protracted failure to even care, the indifference is truly shocking. Deliberate indifference is the conscious or reckless disregard of the consequences of one's acts or omissions. Usually social workers, when they lie, they don't really care you know, what the consequence is as long as the kid gets taken and put wherever they want them. Um, it's satisfied entails something more than negligence, but it's satisfied by something less than, acts or less than acts or omission for the very purpose of causing harm. Again, that goes back to the intent to cause harm. We don't get there on negligence, knew or should have known alone, but we don't have to get to the social worker actually set out and intended to cause me harm. There's something in between, and, and the Ninth Circuit, again, if you look at Hardwick, the Hardwick case, they've resolved what that standard is. And it's really simple. You can't lie in court reports. You can't lie in last minute information, ex parte applications, petitions, warrant affid, anything that you're signing under penalty of perjury or that you're submitting to the court that you know is going to be accepted into evidence and relied on by the court in making its decisions. You can't lie. You have to be truthful, honest, accurate, complete. That's the mantra. And in fact, you'll, you'll weave that into your depositions. Remember, this is actually kind of cool. Your judge, your trial judge, will never, ever, in a million years, give you the instructions on the law as it exists here. Never happen. They're going to give you these plain Jane vanilla things that, you know, flip a coin, it could go either way. Very unclear. Very difficult to deal with. The jurors who have zero experience in this stuff will struggle. So what your job is, as part of that vision that you're creating with your depositions and the stage play that you're putting together, part of your job is going to be through the evidence, through the testimony of your adverse witnesses, to educate the jury about the law, right? So in every one of your depositions, 
you want to try to weave in through your training. You've been trained that. That's, that's a good way to start. You've been there 22 years, and that 22 years, you were trained that in order to lawfully remove a child from the custody of its parents. At the time of the seizure, you must have in your possession specific and articulable facts to show that the child's in immediate danger of suffering, severe bodily injury, or death. And you know this. There's a second component that you explore lesser intrusive alternative means of averting that specific injury. Now, I know that's a long question. You'll get it. Don't worry. Your, your deponent, typically, it always surprises me. It, it shouldn't because it, it happens every time, but it does. It always surprises me. They'll say, hmm, yeah, you know, that sounds, that sounds familiar. <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. And then what you do is you'll see, that, that's your, not, that, that is your jury instruction that the judge will never give you. That's it. But it's not a jury instruction now. It's the social worker testifying under oath. I have been trained, so I knew this. And then your follow-up question is, and you knew that. You knew that back on April 20th or May 20th, 2013, when you seized this child. Yeah, I did. Okay, now we have deliberate indifference. We have reckless disregard. We've got all kinds of stuff going on here, right? And it all came from the witness. Put another zero behind your settlement demand. Oh, that's. Let Let me ask you this first: Is that a state agency or a county or municipal agency? Okay, so you're not going to be able to sue the state agency for money damages anyway, right? right? Your defendant there is still the social worker, right? right? And the state now is telling you, oh yeah, she totally, she screwed up so bad we fired her. Oh, in writing. Yeah. That's great. I'd file my summary judgment motion, just go to trial on damages. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, probably what I'd do first is, is depose a 30B6 deponent. It's in federal court? Yeah, I'd, I'd depose the 30B6 deponent first, get them locked down on you know the who, what, why, where, when, how of this whole termination thing. Probably get a uh, training discipline uh, person most knowledgeable to, and maybe a policy person. So you really lay out what the policies are, what they got trained on, how they discipline them, and specifically how that training and those policies comport with the uh, law, so that you have now a witness testifying under oath about your theory of the legal construct that's going to apply to your case, right? And then you get to, and you fired this lady after a full, complete, thorough investigation of what she did. Yeah, and you fired her because she violated all these rules. Yeah. You know, you get to play that to the jury. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what I've got. And, and what's her defense? I mean, she comes in and says, well, I disagree with my employer. I say, all right, who gives a shit? You know, you, you took these kids and, and everybody suffered and we, you got to pay. And the state, I don't know what your statute is out there. Um, here, the state indemnifies so long as it's within the course and scope of the duties. California, they indemni indemnify, it's still course and scope, but it's a little bit broader. Um, they basically indemnify everything, even punitive damages. I, I got punitive damages in uh, an Orange County case and the county paid it. You know, which is actually cool for us because in, in the next case, ratification is always an issue, right? That's another way to get municipal liability. In order to get ratification, you have to show that the governing body knew or had reason to know of the existence of the problem and didn't do anything to stop it and, in fact, perhaps encouraged it. So what does indemnification for punitive damages do in terms of evidence on your next case? It shows that they encourage it. Hell, they even pay these people's damages when they do it. The government doesn't care. They want these people out there doing these things. That's why they indemnify them. So then that's what you're going to use in your next case to show ratification and approval by the governing body. Yeah? Well, what do you do when the, when the state comes back and says, well, we didn't hire this guy to be an outlaw. You know, we didn't hire him to you know, do all 
That's, that's why right at the outset, before they know what's coming, before they know what your plan is, remember, your vision is your vision. You don't share that with anybody until you're well down the road in your case. You don't want them to be thinking and, and knowing what you're coming up. All these guys that write demand letters and stuff and say, oh, we got this and that and the other thing and we're going to come get you. We don't ever do that. I, I don't want to say it's a stupid move because, you know, it has its purpose in certain contexts. But where your intent is to try the case and you want to work up your case story before the other side even knows what's going on, you don't tell them one goddamn thing that you don't have to tell them. Nothing. Silence. And you just have your vision and you work it. They're going to figure it out at some point. Hopefully, when they figure it out, we'll be in their defense case at trial. <laughs> right? If you've done your job right, they have no clue until they're sitting in front of the jury and the judge tells you, know, you say, yeah, plaintiff rests. Then they just say, <laughs> right? So that, and that's what you want. So you, you get your vision, you work it up, and it is your vision, it is your secret, it's your trade secret. Treat it like that. So anyway, to get down the road, since you anticipate the argument, as you did correctly, in your complaint, you have just one little allegate, one sentence, standing alone. At all times, defendant XYZ was acting within the course and scope of their duties. Period. They will admit that. That's a judicial admission. They're, they're bound. I don't give a shit what they say later. They are bound. That's the end of the story. And if you feel uncomfortable with it, say, well, somehow they may be able to weasel out, give them a request for admission early in the case, as soon as discovery opens. Admit that at all times, XYZ was acting within the course and scope of their duties. They will admit that. Just about every time. I've never had anybody deny it. And then you're, you're set. You've got, you've got two admissions. They can try all they want. They're going to have to move the court to you know, file a motion to back out of it. And they're going to have to show good cause, supported by evidence. What are they going to tell the judge? Oh, well, we didn't understand at the time that he was going to hit us for $10 million and expect <laughs> indemnification. Well, come on. You know, that doesn't work. So, so keep your secrets and anticipate their arguments and to the extent that you can set them up in your complaint in discrete allegations so that you get an early admission before they even have a clue what you're coming at them with right because they're they're always going to come in first they get the complaint they say oh this is all, all a bunch of crap just another whiny parent and they don't take it seriously so they do a bunch of stuff they shouldn't be doing and it, it always works to your benefit all right, distinctions between Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment rights, parents and children. We've talked about this already, although not uh, directly. It's basically the same test when we're looking at an unwarranted seizure between uh, Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment. It's uh, it's the same analysis. Yeah. Uh, that, that's actually a really good question because if, if the parent did not, if there was severance or termination of parental rights, if, if the parent didn't get the child back, the, the parent does not have standing to assert any claims on behalf of the child. They only have standing to assert their own claims. In order to assert the child's claims and their claims, they need to have custody of the child in some form. It doesn't have to be full custody. They just have to have some kind of custody. Um, in, Many of our cases, the, the kids don't come back. Uh, the case uh, we did in 2016 against County Los Angeles, she didn't get her, her child back. So so seven years. The the well, stat, rem remember, statute limitations on these is two years, right? Even under the, the, the well, under the, the federal statute, that two years does not be, begin to run. Because remember, the tort claim filing requirements don't apply to federal claims, right? So that two years doesn't begin to run until the child turns 18. So they have, what, 18 plus 2, 20, right? So you're, you're okay with that once the child is age of majority, they have their claim. Or if at some later point in time, for example, after um, seven or eight years, the kid gets given back to the mom. Now that kid has a claim and mom can pursue it. She has custody, right? And you bet your bottom dollar she's going to do that. So, somebody else. Well, if you take the other case, the teenager who isn't taken from the parent and wants to be, and is injured because of that, 
that gets into a tricky, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to state created danger and special relationship. But typically, generally, it's going to be very uh, fact and case specific. Generally, the government, this uh, applies to firefighters, police, uh, emergency medical technicians, all these government um, health and safety people. Generally, they do not have an affirmative obligation to go out and protect you from harm. They, they have an obligation to not put you in danger. Or once they have undertaken to help you, to not leave you in danger. They have that obligation. But they don't have an obligation to go out and protect us. That's why this might be getting too political, but uh, <laughs> I'll say it anyway. I mean, I've got a captive audience. What are you guys going to do? It, it, it's the issue with, with guns, right? Nobody understands this clearly, but under the law, the police have absolutely no obligation to come out and protect you. Nothing at all. You can call them and say, there's a guy breaking into my house, please get here. Eh, maybe, maybe not. You know, we're going to try because we have that civic duty, but we don't have a legal obligation to come out and save you. That's why I like guns. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You've got a teenager. You're not talking about a baby. You're not talking about a little kid. Mm -hmm. You've got a teenager who says that she, you know, he or she is in danger. Maybe the kid is suicidal um, and, it, and feels that, you know, the continued mm -hmm. existence in that household is, is an immediate threat. The kid feels like that or the police assess that? No. Okay, let me stop you right there. Hold, 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 hold on, let me stop you right there. We're actually going to get to a case on that, and I'm going to suggest that you go read that case, because it seems to me what you're describing is not a case that I would take. I think that the chances of you surviving a 12B6 or a demur on some, that factual situation that you've laid out so far are probably pretty slim. You may be right. Whoever the plaintiff is, whoever, it doesn't matter, whoever the plaintiff is, parent, child, I don't, I don't care which one it is. Okay. I, I think that the duty of the cop at that point is unclear, and even if the legal duty did exist, I think he's going to be in, uh, entitled, maybe, I'm going to be careful what we say because we're being taped, I don't want the defense coming up with this, <laughs> but uh, that maybe um, he'll be entitled to qualified immunity because the law at the time of the conduct was not so clearly established that any reasonable law enforcement agent faced with those same or similar circumstances would know that their failure to act <laughs> violated existing law. Because that, that's the standard. But you might be able to go after DCF for that, for over and for... That, that they're going to they're gonna be entitled to application of the same legal uh, concepts as any other government agent. So I, I think you still have a problem there. Um, but maybe not. I mean, that, that's how new law is made. That's how we get rid of qualified immunity on all these different issues is somebody brings up a new or novel claim, the trial court blows them out, they appeal it, and the appellate court will typically say, yeah, the, the underlying judgment is affirmed. So you lose, plaintiff. But going forward from today, there is this clearly established right that's so clearly established that everybody should know it. And the next one of these cases we get, we're going to tag them. So that's how the, the law and qualified immunity is changed by plaintiffs losing on appeal. That's why it's important that you appeal these things. <laughs> Even though you know, you're going to invest a lot of time, you're going to invest money, the way you broaden the spectrum of our approaches and attacks is by losing on appeal. And the, the appellate court now establishing going forward from today everybody better quit lying. Now establishing going forward from today, you better get warrants. That's how it changes. Somebody lost. So I think I covered this adequately, right? Any questions on this slide? Okay, searches in child abuse cases. Entry into a home, inspection of a home. These all fall under the uh, Fourth Amendment for the, for the parents. Search of the home, you know, rooms, the social workers, I don't know if they do this out here. I assume they do. They probably do it everywhere. They'll go look in the closet, the sock drawer, Backpacks, cabinets, refrigerators, bathrooms, medicine, they'll look at everything. Now, typically, the, the parents will say, oh, I don't have anything to hide. Come on in, look at whatever you want. So that's consent. There's no violation there because the parent consented to it. If the parent does not consent, 
and um, there is no emergent circumstance that would require the social worker to enter and look through the sock drawer and everything else, then that is a violation of the fourth the parent's Fourth Amendment right against unwarranted search and seizure, or searches, anyway. Um, the problem I have with those claims, I've had them come through before, and typically, unless something else really bad happened, it's a, it's a one dollar, it's a, it's a nominal damages case, and you're gonna spend, you know, 100 grand in costs and thousands of hours in labor <coughs> fighting over a dollar, and yeah, you're, you're gonna eventually recover your two or three or five hundred thousand dollars in attorney's fees in five or six years, but was it really worth it? You could have taken the same energy, same money, same time, and devoted it to a case where there were real damages. So you have to sort of, you know, there's violations everywhere. What, what I'm really doing here is trying to give you guys the issues so you can issue spot, right? Where's the issue here? Is there a violation here? What is it? What's the damage? What's the nexus between the violation and the injury? And uh, in order to, I think, to do a competent job of that, you have to have at least an overview of all, what all the potential violations are, what the issues are. Just because we're addressing it here today doesn't mean that, that I think you necessarily ought to go out and file a lawsuit on a search of a sock drawer. So just recognize what we're doing. I'm not telling you to file these lawsuits. I'm just telling you what the issues are. Uh, for the child, what we typically see is visual inspections of the body. They'll maybe go into the home or go to school and uh, have the child drop their pants, raise their shirt, stuff like that. All violations. Calabretta is the seminal case on that issue. Does not require a constitutional scholar to conclude that a nude search of a 13-year-old child is an invasion of constitutional rights of some magnitude. More than that, it is a violation of any known principle of human dignity. So that is the child's Fourth Amendment right. And remember, any time we have a search, because the, the, we have corollary rights, it's like an umbilical cord that runs between the parent and the child. They have these constitutional rights, they're connected. You sever that right for either one, the parent or the child, they both have a claim. It's identical and corollary, right? So the moment the social worker comes in and says to your parent, uh, strip the child down, I need to look at the child's sex organs maybe, and they do that. Um, no warrant, no exigency, both the parent and the child have an equal corollary right, child's Fourth Amendment, parent's Fourteenth Amendment, it's a procedural right, procedural due process claim because we're doing something to the child without the parent's consent and without a warrant. So it's not a substantive claim, it's a procedural claim. 